AC360 did not air on CNN today. For this podcast episode, we are bringing you an hour of CNN coverage from earlier in the day. Hello there, I'm Alicia Malone, host of the Filmstruck podcast, a show made by film lovers for film lovers. Each episode, I sit down with the creative people behind today's movies to talk about their work and why they wanted to make movies in the first place. Subscribe today and listen wherever you get your podcasts. Bye. It's the top of the hour. I'm Brianna Keeler in for Brooke Baldwin. Thank you so much for joining me and a very happy new year to you. In less than an hour, President Trump is expected to fly to Washington after celebrating the start of 2018 at his Florida estate. And about seven hours into the new year, the president launched into his first tweet, slamming Pakistan. He said, quote, the United States has foolishly given Pakistan more than $33 billion in aid over the last 15 years, and they have given us nothing but lies and deceit, thinking of our leaders as fools. They give safe haven to the terrorists that we hunt Uh, in Afghanistan with little help, no more. Within the hour, President Trump sent another tweet, this time about Iran. He said, quote, Iran is failing at every level, despite the terrible deal made with them by the Obama administration. The great Iranian people have been repressed for many years. They are hungry for food and for freedom, along with human rights. The wealth of Iran is being looted Time for change, all in capital letters. Now, the president is referring to anti-government protests in Iran that left 12 people dead this weekend. And as he slams these nations on New Year's Day, North Korea's leader is also seizing the moment. Kim Jong-un told his people that the mainland U.S. is within his range and, quote, the nuclear button is always on the desk in my office. Joining me now is CNN White House correspondent Abby Phillips. She's with the president in Florida. Abby, when he gets back to the White House, what is first on his agenda? Hi, Brianna. Well, the president is preparing to come back to D.C. any minute now this afternoon, and he's going to be really uh, launching into a full agenda uh, policy-wise, talking a little bit about infrastructure over the break. Uh, He's also going to be looking at welfare reform. He's going to be sitting down with congressional leaders in both the House and the Senate, uh, Mitch McConnell in the Senate and Paul Ryan in the House, and they're going to be hashing out the plan for the the coming months, uh, all of this leading up to his State of the Union address at the end of January, of course. Uh, But overnight, at his New Year's Year's Eve celebration at his Mar-a-Lago club, uh, the president really touted some of the the things that he is very proud that he was able to do over the last year and suggested that uh, more is coming in 2018. Listen to what he had to say. We're going to have a great 2018. It's going to be something very, very special. It's all kicking in. Everybody's going to love is what's happening with our country because we're taking this big, beautiful ship and we're slowly turning it around. I'd like to do it faster. Well, the president also uh, told the, uh, those uh, supporters and guests of his Mar-a-Lago club uh, that uh, he also had some enemies, but he was hopeful that those enemies would turn around and uh, start to, to like him or love him more in 2018. Uh, the, the White House is preparing uh, to also really launch into the midterm elections. And so there's a lot of uh, uh, work being done to prepare for uh, that political uh, you know, battle that they're facing with Democrats in the fall. Uh, a couple of changes coming staff-wise to the White House. Uh, so the president has a pretty full plate once he gets back to D.C. later this afternoon. All right, Abby, Philip for us in West Palm Be- uh, Beach. Thank you so much. Now, if we hear from President Trump as he leaves Florida or when he arrives in Washington, we could get a response to what's been a very strong statement from North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. America will never be able to provoke war or attack us. The entire continent of America is within reach of our nuclear attack. They must never forget the nuclear button is placed on my desk at all times. They must realize correctly that this is not a threat but reality. 
Well, that was just a sample of what Kim had to say during his annual New Year's Day address. And CNN Pentagon correspondent Barbara Starr is with us now. Uh, so, Barbara, Kim chose to start 2018 with a very strong warning for the, uh, for the United States. What do you make of what we heard there? Well, you know, he listens to uh, everything that the U.S. is saying. He, too, is briefed on, on what is happening. And so he sees very strong language from President Trump. And I think it's fair to say he's constantly evaluating what that means for him because his number one threat that he perceives is would be anything that would threaten his survival, his family's survival, his regime's survival. And that uh, intelligence experts will tell you that's what he's really aimed at here, keeping himself in power in North Korea. So he constantly is talking about what his military capabilities are. What about on this side? Well, military commanders in the, here will tell you they always plan for believing that what Kim is threatening is accurate, that he does have the capability to range the United States with his missiles and weapons. Now, there are technical problems. Can he actually point a missile with a warhead, put it on a precise target at a point in time? That's a very complex matter. And he probably, the assessment is, can't quite do that. But you have to plan for that possibility. And so I think it's fair to say when the Pentagon, when the CIA looks at this, they go into 2018 the same way they came out of 2017 believing his threats are real, providing options to the president. But here at the Pentagon, what Defense Secretary Mattis will tell you, diplomacy still front and center, diplomacy backed up by economic pressure. They still believe there is room for that to work. Brianna? Uh, Kim says, Barbara, that North Korea can strike any part of North America. It sounds like you're saying maybe there's the range, but there isn't that specificity. What do we know exactly about North Korea's capabilities? Well, there's something called, well, we won't get too much into rocket science on New Year's Day, but there is something called re-entry to put a long-range ballistic missile on a target with that warhead striking. You have to go way up into the atmosphere, be able to come back down, re-enter the atmosphere, have the missile and the warhead survive the heat and pressure of re-entering the atmosphere and have the guidance systems to take it exactly to a target. That's his challenge right now. But again, when you look at that, you're looking at that through Western eyes. That's how we would see the challenge. If it came to it, would he be satisfied just, you know, basically launching a missile and letting it go wherever it goes? Brianna? A scary thought. Barbara Starr for us. Thank you so much. New protests broke out in Iran's capital today as demonstrators continue to vent their anger against the government. So far, 12 protesters and one police officer have been killed, which first broke out in more remote cities last week. But now we're seeing more unrest in Tehran, where some have been shouting, quote, down with the dictator. CNN senior international correspondent Arwa Damon is watching the protests from neighboring Istanbul uh, or from uh, neighboring Turkey there in Istanbul. So what can you tell us about the new protests, Arwa, and the Iranian government's response so far? Well, these protests, especially those that are taking place in Tehran, are being described as something of a cat and mouse game where you have small groups of protesters coming out, sh shouting slogans in front of the riot police and then running away into the alleyways. But we are seeing this momentum over the last few days continuing, despite the fact that the uh, Iranian government is to a certain degree trying to calm down tempers over the weekend. 12 people died, two on Saturday, 10 on Sunday. And then we've just heard about an incident that took place in the center of the country where a protester who was described as creating a disturbance used a hunting rifle to shoot and kill one police officer, wounding another three in the city of Najafabad. Now, Iran's president has come out on a number of different occasions over the last few days recognizing to a certain degree the need for economic reform, accepting the fact that these protesters, when it comes to the economic downward spiral that Iran has been in, do have legitimate cause for grievance. In fact, after a, mem uh, a meeting with members of parliament, President Rouhani said, we have no bigger challenge than unemployment. Our economy requires major corrective surgery. But the government has been cracking down on these demonstrations, and it has repeatedly been saying that people that go out and cause chaos and violence 
will be dealt with. There's also been quite a bit of back and forth between the Iranian and U.S. presidents, with President Rouhani most recently coming out and saying that President Trump has absolutely no right to criticize the Iranian government and has absolutely no right to sympathize with Iran because in the past he's called the Iranian people terrorists. And President Rouhani has also been saying that it is Trump himself that is constantly creating problems for Iranians, including these visa and financial issues. Now, it's worth to note that what's interesting, at least for observers when it comes to these protests, is that they're happening across the entire country and there doesn't seem to be a particular group or a particular individual that is leading them. So outside of this anger that we're seeing percolating, brewing on the streets, it's unclear as to whether or not these protesters themselves actually have a definitive, specific goal in mind, Brianna. Very good point. Arwa Damon in Istanbul, thank you for that report. Next, we will discuss the White House response to North Korea and Iran with Republican Congressman Lee Zeldin. And the Rose Bowl kicks off this afternoon. We have a live report from the sidelines. And then more than three months after Hurricane Maria, will a new year bring some new hope to Puerto Rico? CNN will take you there where many are turning to a higher power for help. Hey, I'm Mackenzie Atwood, and have you seen Jim Cation, the new Steven Universe episode on Cartoon Network? Do you want to learn more about it? I thought you did. That's why you need to check out the exclusive mini recap of Jim Cation on the Steven Universe podcast. Writer Ben Levin gives us an inside look at how it came together. So watch Jim Cation on Cartoon Network and then listen to the podcast at Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. Welcome back. While the president has a big domestic agenda planned for 2018, right now foreign affairs are on his mind, judging from his Twitter feed. And with me now to discuss this and more is Congressman Lee Zeldin. He is a Republican from New York, and he is a member of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. Congressman, a very happy new year to you, and we certainly appreciate you spending your holiday with us. It's great to be with you. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. So I want to start with the protest that we've seen in Iran. The president has responded to this. Um, he tweeted, and it was at the end of the tweet that really is, is sort of something that I think is raising some eyebrows because he says time for change. Uh, it, it's, an, it's a situation in Iran where it's really unclear kind of who is leading the protesters. The, uh, it seems to be pretty diffuse as far as the organization. Do you think that it's smart for him to say time for change at this point in time? Uh, I, well, I do. I, I've been outspoken for years uh, in favor of there being a regime change in Iran. Uh, what's really important to note within Iran is you have millions of Iranians uh, who want, desperately want, a free, stable, democratic Iran. Uh, they're literally going back decades. Uh, they have been fighting, waiting for an opportunity, uh, but fighting a dictatorial a regime that has uh, suppressed human rights, uh, economic opportunity. They see money get squandered uh, on pointless uh, exercises outside of their own borders, uh, and they want a better way of life for their people. So uh, th these people who are taking to the streets, uh, it's just really important as we're watching it just to note that history and how desperate uh, we that we are witnessing literally millions of Iranians who want regime change for what seems to be all the right reasons. Uh, it, they have some different reasons, though, Congressman, as you know, and uh, they they do seem to be a little. Uh, there seems to be some variance between the protesters and what they want. How careful does the U.S. government have to be about weighing in, appearing to put a finger on the scale for the protesters? when a lot of what's going on is unclear, especially when you look back to some of the lessons of the Arab Spring, which was it is difficult to see at the time when something is happening what the exact objective is, if you do call for change, what comes in the wake of change. Should there be caution on the part of the American government here? Uh, well, one thing that would be very helpful is if Iran was uh, truly holding democratic elections and the Iranian people were able to choose a better future for themselves. Some of the coverage here in the United States will cover an Iranian election and, and say that the, uh, the Iranian people elected the most moderate 
names that are on the ballot. And to a certain point, that's true. However, it's really important to note that the 12,000 most moderate uh, candidates will be kicked off the ballot before that, you know, that opportunity actually uh, to cast that vote will take place. Uh, so I, I really I, I have faith in the Iranian people when given that opportunity to truly be able to uh, elect those who are leading them uh, in Tehran, that they will be casting a vote for a different future, a better future for their country. We don't have to do that for the Iranians. But what we also want to be very careful about is if we're too cautious to the point where we're actually propping up this current regime, uh, and yeah. th there's any missed opportunity of empowerment for those Iranians, uh, that would be unfortunate at the same time. So Senator Lindsey Graham actually wants the president to do more, and he tweeted this. He said, I would explain uh, what a better deal would look like. It's not enough to watch. President Trump is tweeting uh, very sympathetically to the people of Iran, but you just can't tweet here. You have to lay out a plan. Do you agree with him? Oh, well, there's there's no doubt uh, about that, that uh, as it relates to uh, the Iran nuclear deal, the, the JCPOA uh, and the path forward as, a, you know, with regards to our relationship with Iran and the international community's relationship with Iran, uh, there are some uh, really bad flaws with the deal that have to get corrected. First and foremost is uh, the sunset provision that takes place. But beyond that, uh, there's still a lack of clarity but, but on the verification regime. But he's saying that he's saying that President. Uh, these, this is about President Trump. This isn't about the Obama Iran deal. He's saying the president shouldn't just be tweeting. You can't just tweet here. He says. Do you agree with that? Well, I don't. I don't think the president is just tweeting here. I mean, he he over the course of the last couple of days have put out a a number of tweets uh, with regards to what we're talking about. Uh, but going back to the end of uh, 2017, over the course of the, the last couple of months, there was a, a decertification of the Iran nuclear deal. The president made a speech that went, you know, beyond putting aside the nuclear deals, uh, Iran dealing with Iran's bad activities. They're test firing intercontinental ballistic missiles in violation of U.N. Security Council resolutions. Uh, the international community really needs to deal with that strongly. They've uh, Iranians overthrowing foreign governments in their efforts in, in Yemen or financing uh, Hezbollah or Assad in Syria. Uh, I just got back from the Middle East a few days ago. I uh, visited Afghanistan, Kuwait, Jordan. Uh, there's a lot of concern for Iranian activities in these other uh, countries, and these other Arab nations are deeply concerned with uh, Iranian aggression. So beyond Iran's rhetoric of calling the United States the great Satan, pledging death to America, are these uh, real concerning activities of aggression within the Middle East. I, you know, the president over the course of the last couple of months, especially of 2017, though, uh, they were w weighing in with regards to Iran's other bad activities beyond just talking about the nuclear deal. Okay, let's turn to North Korea, because um, the president, uh, obviously, there's always been a lot of fiery rhetoric coming from the president when it comes to North Korea. But are you convinced that the administration has a strategy about how to deal with North Korea? Uh, yes, and it, you know, as it relates to identifying good options, this has been the huge challenge because no one knows of any good options for dealing with North Korea that doesn't involve China. Uh, all of the options, when we're talking about multilateral diplomacy, ramping up economic pressure against the North Koreans, uh, the I in the dime principle, uh, which is information. So this is diplomacy, information, military, economics. Working all of the other levers other than the military option, any good option is going to involve China. There have been some uh, positive developments in 2017. Over the summer, there was a unanimous vote at the U.N. Security Council that effectively uh, cuts off over a third of North Korean exports. Uh, that's great. Uh, there was a setback towards the end of the year. There's a development that uh, I'm looking forward to getting more information about with regards to oil exports from China to North Korea. Now, when you put aside all the good options and you look at what would be the last possible option that uh, we should ever be considering, but one that you have to be prepared for, the full range of conventional to unconventional military options, there's no good option there. I know that over the course of the year, there was... Uh, a very serious, uh, conscious effort to get the full range of options as prepared as possible. 
uh, none, of the, none of those options are good. Now, I will also add, too, uh, in talking to our military, even though I was in the Middle East, uh, talking to some of our generals and those who are, who are running uh, the operations there, you can tell when North Korea came up uh, that they are hugely sensitive to just how serious, uh, from a military perspective, those possibilities are. And I have not met a single person in the United States government, doesn't matter whether you're Republican, Democrat, whether you're in the legislature or you're in the executive branch, I have not met anyone who wants war with North yeah. Korea, but uh, I've also met a ton of people understanding we have to be prepared for it uh, if it, if it came down to it. All right, Congressman Lee Zeldin, thank you so much uh, for talking about all of these uh, issues with us. We appreciate it, and Happy New Year. It's great to be on with you. Happy New Year. And up next, as President Trump winds down his working vacation at Mar-a-Lago, his former chief strategist says January could be pivotal for his presidency. We're going to discuss what's on the agenda. And more than three months after Hurricane Maria ravaged Puerto Rico, thousands still do not have power. Some don't have homes. And as we found out firsthand, hope is also hard to come by as the new year begins. Within the hour, the president is expected to take his first Air Force One flight of the year to Washington, where he plans to embark on a, quote, great new year. That coming from one of his first tweets of 2018. So how will his second year in office go? Joining me now to talk about it is Franco Ordonez, White House correspondent for McClatchy's Washington Bureau, and Lynn Sweet, Washington Bureau Chief for the Chicago Sun-Times. Okay, so we know, Franco, that the president is hoping for an infrastructure bill. He's hoping for some bipartisanship with Democrats. Democrats want to get a fix for the dreamers, young people who came to the U.S., uh, undocumented, but really have no home but the U.S. What are the chances that there could actually be bipartisanship here? I think there's a potential for some bipartisanship. I mean, Trump is talking a big plan. He's talking optimistic. He's talking a lot about bipartisanship. As we know, he's a deal maker. He wants to make the deal. He's not driven by necessarily ideology. He's made it tough for himself, lashing out at Democrats. But I think right now, after Alabama, after Virginia, as well as tax reform giving some, being done and giving some space, I think there is an opportunity in those two areas that you talked about. How does he win some Democrats over, other than, I guess, their priorities being aligned? But doesn't some of this also have to do with uh, he might have to personally make overtures that would make them want to work with him, Lynn? Well, yes and no. Here's what he probably will come to realize, that you don't make a demand and call that a negotiation when you say, I'll do something for dreamers if you build a wall and we pay for it. May I suggest that is not the best way to start off on having a negotiation. Look at something both sides want and that you need 60 senators to execute. Oh, what could that be? Infrastructure. Not hard on everybody's agenda. So if you tie the deep priority desire of the Democrats to let the dreamers remain in the United States legally with the desire to get something done on infrastructure, you might have some more makings of a deal than just tying it to a demand to one Trump-identified priority, which, by the way, the president had said Mexico will pay for, not the United States. Is he making this a... Is he attaching a poison pill, the wall, which a lot of folks have said, look, this could look like different things. He could say it's a wall, but really yeah, certain so areas could not be a wall. They wallish. Wallish, fence-ish, fence. whatever. Um, is that, though, even just with the rhetoric, does he create a situation where then some voters, some supporters potentially of Democrats would say, no way, you're going along with the wall? Like, we're not, we're not okay with this. We're not going to support you for that. I think, I think there is that risk, but I see it as more as a leverage point. I mean, the, the wall and chain migration, I think he's trying to push as far as he can and see what he pulls back on. As you pointed out, it could be a fence. It could be some other type of border security. He is having these conversations uh, privately. He's saying some type of border security with protections for the dreamers. I think it's potential. 
you know, you still have the Bannon wing of the party that you're going to have to fight. This is not going to be an easy thing. But certainly Democrats really want to get this done. A lot of Republicans do, too. I mean, they do not want to be going into midterm campaign season with the potential of all these thousands of immigrants losing their work permits. A very interesting bit of reporting coming from The New York Times, Lynn, that George Papadopoulos, who was the first Trump campaign advisor to plead guilty to lying to the FBI, had told an Australian diplomat back in May of 2016. So this is leading up to the election. This is like the spring summer leading up to the election and told him that the Russians had dirt on Hillary Clinton. This, according to this reporting, after a night of heavy drinking. And the Australians, once WikiLeaks, the DNC emails started coming out in July of 2016, the Australians then looped in the Americans and said, hey, this is this is what we heard. And that may have actually been what prompted this initial investigation into Russian meddling in the election. That really undercuts what the president has said, that it is this dossier that is, uh, you know, a terrible thing to rely on, although some of the things in it are accurate. This undercuts what the president's saying. But more than undercuts it, here are just a few things to think of on that story about uh, George Papadopoulos, who is a resident of Chicago's north side. Okay, the narrative has been as you described. So just look at it from the FBI perspective. They were willing to disclose that Hillary Clinton was under investigation by the FBI. And now it is so much more clear that they didn't disclose that Donald Trump was under investigation by the FBI. Uh, the people who believe... Or the Trump campaign. The Trump yeah. campaign. I'm yeah. sorry. The yeah. Trump campaign. We now know that it may likely not be true that the dossier sparked this, but that somebody within the Trump tent did, which changes a lot of the narrative for what so many of Trump and his allies have been saying. And now what we should be watching for is what they say in reaction to this story. As soon as everybody gets back to Washington, it's going to be hard to explain away this one, Brie. Because they've been alleging un unfair yes. treatment, right? Yes. Very interesting. Lynn Sweet, Franco Ordonez, thank you so much. Happy thank New you. Year to Happy both New of you. Year. Happy thank New Year. Happy New Year. And up next, we will take you to Puerto Rico, where thousands of people are still without power more than three months after Hurricane Maria. How residents are holding on to hope there. Next. While many Americans ushered in the new year with champagne, others did it without running water and without power. The fight to survive continues in Puerto Rico, where it's been more than three months since Hurricane Maria tore through the island, knocking out power to just about everyone. Now, months later, thousands are still in the dark. Even in the holiest of places, where prayers for 2018 are sent to a higher power. It's hard to escape the realities of life after Maria. The problems, the needs, the sorrows, the hope. Father Colacho Gracias por ese ofrecimiento. sees it every day in the streets he's walked for 20 years in the community that has relied on his guidance. They come to church to charge the heart. But to charge the cell phone. Before mass on New Year's Eve, Jorge Alicea plugs in his phone, a tablet, and the lamp that will get him through another night in the place he's called home for decades. Now, so no power, no water. No roof. Much progress has been made here in San Juan, the capital, the tourist areas, even the financial district moving forward right now. But in its shadow, Cantera, it is an area where people feel forgotten, want more help, still no power. And for 2018, high hopes can be hard to find. He says the new year is just another year in which he's waiting for someone to come and help him. Jorge doesn't expect help anytime soon. He says FEMA told him he doesn't qualify for a temporary roof. His home is too damaged. I'm asking him when it rains here. They get wet. It's that simple. Keep fighting. Keep trying. Start again. We are with you. You are not alone. Words of comfort, Father Colacho knows, will only go so far for Jorge and Cantera. What will New Year's look like here? New Year, they say new life. It's not new life, it's new fight. And so here, 
where they've made the town of Bethlehem look like their own, blue tarps and all, they pray. Pray for the miracles they believe in. Pray for the strength to rebuild in the new year. And Layla Santiago is joining us now from San Juan. Um, Layla, what has surprised you most about what you're seeing on the ground there months after Maria hit? Listen, uh, Brianna, there is a recovery in place. I mean, you really are starting to see Mother Nature. You still see power crews out there working on lines. But I think what has been most surprising is the difference between what you see here in San Juan, and specifically where I am right now in Condado, the, the tourist areas, and then what you see up in the mountains, in the remote parts of the interior, in the southeast where we were uh, last week. It is so different in the level of recovery. They still don't have water. They still don't have power. Uh, you know, just in that story, you see Jorge there. He actually still locks his home uh, because that's the only place he has to sleep at night. But it's destroyed. There is no roof. So for me, what has been most eye opening is just where the recovery is and where it's not. Leila Santiago, thank you for your continued reporting as we move into 2018 in Puerto Rico. We do appreciate it. And coming up, a royal wedding, a World Cup, and a record-breaking stock market. We'll tell you what to watch for in 2018. 2017 is in the history books, but many of the headlines will go 2.0 in 2018. From extreme weather threats to global politics, our CNN correspondents take a look at what to expect over the next 365 days. Here's what we're looking forward to in politics in 2018. Well, it's an even-numbered year, which means midterm elections. And midterm elections are almost always bad for the president's party. They almost always lose seats in the House and in the Senate. That goes double when the president's approval rating is under 50 percent, and Donald Trump's is way under 50 percent now. The House is absolutely in play. Republicans hold the majority, but there are enough Democratic opportunities out there to make it a real possibility Democrats retake the House come November 2018. The Senate, a tougher thing for Democrats. There are 26 Democratic seats up to just nine for Republicans. But Democrats have, oddly, a little bit of a chance here. They've gotten a lot of good breaks. And remember, Donald Trump is not very popular, which makes taking over the Senate a very slight but still still a real possibility. La Nina is expected to continue through the rest of the winter, which typically brings warmer and dry conditions to the southeast. It also normally means a wetter than normal pattern in the Pacific Northwest. But if it hangs on through spring and even summer, hurricane season could be interesting. La Nina usually means above normal hurricane activity in the Atlantic. 2018 is going to be a big year for the British royal family, not least because we're going to have a blockbuster royal wedding. Prince Harry will marry the American actress Meghan Markle at Windsor Castle in May. She's divorced, she's biracial, she's a vocal women's rights campaigner, three firsts for a senior royal, so expect a fairy tale to play out, but also a debate on how the British monarchy is gaining relevance in new areas. Also in the spring, royal baby number three for the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge. And in November, Prince Charles, Britain's longest serving heir to the throne, will turn 70. North Korea is really at a crossroads as we move into 2018. Most experts agree they're on the verge of finalizing their nuclear program. They've threatened more missile launches, possibly an above ground nuclear test. And there are security concerns ahead of the Winter Olympics in South Korea. Pyongyang wants to be recognized as a nuclear power. Washington has said that won't happen. So the question, will 2018 be a year for diplomacy or something else? The answer lies largely with Donald Trump and Kim Jong-un. 2018 will be highlighted by two high-profile global sporting events, the Winter Olympics in South Korea and the FIFA World Cup. With the Winter Games being held approximately 50 miles from volatile North Korea and with Russia banned from competition, these Olympics already have plenty of off-the-ice intrigue ahead of February 9th's iconic lighting of the Olympic flames. In June, fans from around the globe will descend on 11 Russian cities to witness the passion and pride of the FIFA World Cup. With Italy, United States, and the Netherlands failing to qualify, 
debutantes like Iceland with their fans' infectious Viking thunderclap will aim to disrupt cup titans like Brazil and Germany this summer. 2018 will likely bring some big changes to our health care system. On one hand, President Trump has renewed his vow to completely dismantle the Affordable Care Act, possibly leaving millions without health care insurance. But we're also on the verge of major developments with new gene therapies to treat cancer, heart disease, even Alzheimer's, bringing new hope to many patients. And we're finally getting serious about an American-made problem, the opioid epidemic, one of the leading causes of death in the United States today. And President Trump was making his own prediction for 2018 when he spoke to guests at last night's New Year's Eve party at Mar-a-Lago. Here's some audio from that speech obtained by CNN. The country, by the way, is doing great. We just got our taxes cut. We have jobs pouring into the country. Europe isn't too happy with us because a lot of people are moving back into the United States. A lot of money is coming. You know, we have $4 trillion that's coming back. And we're doing it the way it should be. And I'll tell you, there's more to come. So what is the economic forecast for 2018? Joining me now is CNN Global Economic Analyst Rana Faruhar. So Rana, first, let's start with what the president said there. Is he right about jobs pouring into the country? What is the uh, economic outlook in your view? Well, I think pouring is a little bit too strong. You know, we've had some pretty good job growth really over the last couple of years. I think that that's going to continue, certainly in the first half of 2018. Um, But a lot of the prosperity that some people are feeling has really been predicated on the stock market being so high. Um, That's really what's been driving the economy. The big question uh, for me is, yeah, I think we're going to continue to see some stock market growth, some asset uh, prices going up in the next six months or so. But if the stock market it fails, um, and I can talk a little bit more about that, then are you going to see job growth also start to sputter? That's a big question. I think that that's something to look ahead to in the second half of 2018 as a potential risk. We'll talk about that. Uh, Because the stock market has been doing so well, if folks are going into the new year, they're a little worried perhaps this isn't going to last, they have money to invest, what should they do? So what's going on right now is we've just had this big Republican tax plan go through. That's been a big break for corporations. They are probably, and and the president's right about this, going to bring back some of that overseas cash hoard that they've been uh, stashing uh, in tax havens abroad. But the question is, where is it going to go? Is it going to go into kind of real Main Street investments, worker training, factories, et cetera? Or is it going to go straight into the stock market? I'm going to say the latter. I think that you're going to see companies buying back their own shares, which makes the market go up. But it's kind of a sugar high. It's sort of an artificial kind of growth. And so I think that there's a potential that once that tapers off, maybe in the summer, maybe in the second half of the year, that you could see a correction. So if I were uh, the average investor, I'd start to think about maybe holding a little bit of cash on the sidelines, um, thinking about when you're going to need your money. Uh, Don't make any sudden changes if you aren't going to need it tomorrow. But know that we probably will see a correction uh, in the second half of the year. It's a very good point. And then as we are looking now into this new year, is there anything that taxpayers need to be doing to prepare for the changes uh, with the new tax law? So, you know, a lot of this is still being sorted out by accountants. Uh, you know, I just spoke to my own <laughs> a couple of weeks ago, and they're, they're scratching their heads. There's so many changes. But one thing that I would recommend that anyone who's an independent contractor, a freelancer, or has a small business should look at whether or not they should be a pass-through business. Pass-through businesses are businesses where those individual uh, small business owners can actually take advantage of certain loopholes. So in this new tax bill, they would be able to uh, write off about 23% of their income. There are some costs associated with doing this, but it's something that people should check out if if they're uh, running a small business or working for themselves. Rana Faruhar explaining it all very clearly to us. Thank you so much and a happy new year. Happy new year to you. Now coming up, it is playoff day in college football and the first of two games will kick off here in about an hour. We are live in Pasadena, California, where Georgia and Oklahoma will slug it out for a spot in the national championship. All right, college football playoff day is officially here. We have two big matchups tonight, Georgia versus Oklahoma in the legendary Rose Bowl, and then Clemson taking on Alabama in the Sugar Bowl. And, of course, the two winners will face each other in next week's national championship. Well, CNN's Paul Verkamen, what a terrible assignment you have there on the sidelines in Pasadena where the Bulldogs and the Sooners are about to kick off the first of these two semifinals. 
Yes, this is a tough one, Brianna. And by the way, you and I have covered floods together and fires, so once in a while it's okay. Yeah. Electric <laughs> atmosphere here in the Rose Bowl. You've got Oklahoma and Georgia. Oklahoma boasting the Heisman Trophy winner, Baker Mayfield. Georgia has perhaps the most unsung hero in college football, Nick Chubb. He's dynamic. And the fans are just loving this picture postcard chamber of commerce weather. Georgia and Oklahoma, and there's a whole lot of people here who are all dressed up with somewhere to go. The Rose Bowl, let's listen to them. We've got like a Lucha Libre kind of wrestling thing going on here. Yes, because we're going to light a smack down on Georgia today. <laughs> oh, no, we're great, man. We got our hard hats on. We're ready to rock and roll and put some work in. We're going to run all over them. So let them kind of bring it. Hey, they haven't faced an SEC defense. They're going to face it today. They're going down. So the teams are fired up, the fans are fired up, and Brianna, owing to your Southern California roots and knowing that you play a little golf, so next time you come out here, you golf 18, you get the sunscreen, you see the game, you know, that's like kind of your speed, right? Definitely. Paul, oh my gosh, I can feel the energy and I can feel the nice weather. And uh, do you have a prediction? Do you have a uh, preference today? I do not have a bold prediction because I'm not going to get myself in trouble with either the Georgia or the <laughs> Oklahoma fans. I will tell you, here's a cluster of people who played very well here this year, and I saw it in person. Coldplay killed it, and so did you two in the Rose Bowl. It was a great year in 2017. Well, in the middle of all of your hard work, it's nice that you've been able to spend a little bit of time there at the Rose Bowl. Paul Verkhamen, uh, we will await the outcome of the big game, sir. Thank you so much for that report. Well, and who knew that a flight within a flight could be so disruptive? Passengers and crew on a Delta Airlines jet, well, they were taken on quite a ride this weekend, and it was all because of a bird that flew into the cockpit. This story is wild. So this was an Atlanta-bound plane, and it was taxiing at Detroit's airport on Saturday, and then the captain realizes that there is this bird in the plane and suddenly he has to turn back because of it so that's not even the end of it because then crew members and maintenance workers were scrambling to find the bird but they couldn't find the bird it was nowhere to be found and of course in this day and age you had a passenger who was live tweeting the entire ordeal and this is what they said giving us the update this bird is playing hide and go seek apparently well, convinced that it wouldn't be too much trouble if this bird reappeared, the pilots decided, you know, we need to get the show on the road. We're going to take off. But then, once they're airborne, guess who shows up again? That's right. A passenger says the captain at this point in time came on the loudspeaker. He says the bird is in the cockpit and the bird's going a little nuts. And to be safe, he had to turn back around in that plane and go back to Detroit. So, once on the ground... A crew member captured the bird, managed to find it, and then set it free outside of the plane. And about an hour later, the plane did finally take off again. It made it to Atlanta, minus this wayward bird. Very cute story going into this new year. And I thank you so much for joining us on Newsroom. A very happy new year to you. The 70s starts right now.